welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our second installment of Women in Dentistry um, video or webinar series. Today we have with us an amazing host, an amazing speaker, and I'll tell you about her in just a minute. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself, who I am, and who Women in Dentistry is, and what our plans are going forward with the webinars that we're going to be offering. So my name is Effie Hafsha. I am a prosthodontist. I work in Toronto, that's in Canada, Ontario. And uh, we founded a Women in Dentistry Work-Life Balance Study Group 10 years ago. So we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary. And we were supposed to have an in-person symposium on April 24th. But of course, because of the world and the way it is, that had to be postponed. And we decided to remain connected with our, with our you know, colleagues through the virtual platform, so through Zoom. So we've decided to you know, bring to you topics over the next few weeks and months. And really, I think this will be an ongoing platform that will connect with dentists um, and our motto or part of our mission with this group is to talk not only about the clinical side of dentistry but about life and work and balance and with that in mind we felt that a very relevant relevant topic to talk about is the effects on the effects of COVID or the effects of this pandemic pandemic on our mental health we all know there's certainly a financial strain um, that we are all feeling, and we know that there's definitely a physical uh, strain in terms of, unfortunately, people getting sick or just feeling sick around the pandemic. But beyond that, and I think, you know, my conversations with Dr. Sally Safa, um, you know, mental health is a real issue here. And so in light of wanting to bring more than just clinical knowledge to dentistry or to, to our audience, we've come up with this presentation today. And with that introduction, um, I'd like to talk to you or introduce you to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Sally Safa. Uh, Dr. Sally, is, Sally Safa is a periodontist. She works in North York or in Toronto, Ontario. And Sally is a really interesting person. She's a, she's a superb periodontist, a very skilled clinician. But beyond that, she has delved into uh, mindfulness is part of her um, additional qualification. So she studied mindfulness-based stress reduction to learn coping skills for dealing with, the, with daily stresses as a dentist. She founded Mindful Dentist, which is uh, a website, mindfuldentist.ca, where her intention is to bring the evidence and tools taught in mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR as we'll be referring to it, to the dental community to help cope with stress and anxiety in dentistry. She's given a lot of talks, she's written a lot of papers or several papers on this topic, and today we're going to focus specifically on tools on how to manage your anxiety, how to deal with your mental health during this pandemic. So with that introduction, Sally, welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much, Effie. You are a dear friend and an amazing clinician, and it's an honor to be on this platform. Um, I always enjoy speaking to you and with women in dentistry. Um, and so first, thank you for having me on your amazing yeah. series. I watched your previous one and it was wonderful. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's joined in uh, today. And so thank you for coming on this journey with us. And my hope today is to uh, pass on some information that I know about anxiety and stress and uh, hope that we can generate a nice discussion so that we can also include any concerns and questions that are coming from the audience. I think Effie's going to keep track of that. And uh, yeah, and by way of introduction, I just, um, you know, my, my focus and my um, my education in, in mindfulness has been through mindfulness-based stress reduction, but really it's, uh, it is applicable um, in any mindfulness platform. What, what intrigued me about mindfulness-based stress reduction is that it's science-based and uh, the science helps us dentists understand why we should try to incorporate some mindfulness in our day-to-day -day lives. So I thank you for having me on, Effie, on this It's platform. my pleasure. And for those of you who don't know, Sally and I spoke about this about five years ago when she was just getting into mindfulness as part of her, you know, expanding her horizons and dentistry. And she had her own personal journey, which she may or may not share, but we felt that it was a really relevant topic. And since then, we've done a couple of, of lectures or a couple of um, in-person seminars, and it's resonated really well. So I think, you know, Sally, why don't you tell us really in your words how you got into uh, MBSR? 
Tell us why, yeah. you're, why you've done it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so basically, it was it was the personal experience of burnout, or what uh, now clinically can be diagnosed as burnout. But mine was more of a personal feeling. I, I you know, uh, I think the. Um, World Health Organization has now considered burnout, especially for professionals, to be a truly, you know, a classified d disease, I guess. But really, mine was just knowing that something was not okay. I was having panic attacks, anxiety attacks, and I and I knew that I I wasn't living the life that I wanted to live. Um, I was living sort of a very much chaotic uh, kind of go, go, go type of life. So I needed to, to have a change. And so five years ago, I kind of just started to read books. Some of, some of them, many of you are familiar with, um, you know, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now was one of the big ones that many of us read. And um, really that introduced me to using tools and mindfulness. And so it started to help me. I started to build coping and, and resilience skills that, that I could apply every day. And it was in a conversation that Effie, you and I had those many years ago that I, I remember you know, that evening. You remember yeah. That? Yeah, yeah, and that I felt alone. And we were, I think, sitting at Starbucks. And I said, you know, Effie, I'm using these tools or, or, you know, I really had this experience and you encouraged me and said, you know, I really think that many of us are feeling this way. And just that in dentistry, we just don't talk about it that much. So then my, my journey has been and through, through um, you know, the, the push to kind of talk about it was to actually um, open up the conversation. And I'm so glad we did because that's allowed for many of us to, to really acknowledge that that stress we all share and the anxieties we share. And, you know, there are tools that we can use that we can apply every day to help cope with anxiety. We were talking about it way back, anxiety, you know, coping in dentistry, but those same tools are now applicable in our current COVID crisis. Right. So when you talk about coping tools, what, what exactly are you referring to, Sally? Yeah. So uh, the first thing is kind of awareness that, that we are in a state of anxiety and fear. And let's just be, let's just be 100% honest that um, that is a completely normal reaction. For, for those of you who are feeling extreme amount of fear and anxiety is to acknowledge that we all share that right now. You are not, um, th there is nothing wrong with you. If you are in a heightened state of anxiety, stress, and, and, and really dysregulation, we are all sharing that same space. I, I share that space with everybody too. And so for me, it has been um, using these practices that we're gonna talk about even for myself every day. So the tools that, that we're gonna share um, here all start with first acknowledging how we're feeling. And so if you are feeling that your emotions are on a roller coaster with what we call being outside of our zone or window of tolerance, that's normal. So what happens in mindfulness, we try to build what's called our window of tolerance. That's a space where our emotions can go up and down, but we don't shoot out into outer space, you know, kind of completely frazzled. Um, which is called hyper arousal. That's when we shoot kind of outside the window up but we can also shoot outside the window down. And many people uh, maybe can relate to this where they go hypo arousal. I don't hang out in hypo arousal. I always go hyper arousal. You definitely, right? you definitely don't. Yeah. Many of us go up, you know, we shoot right up. But there's people that go down and become hypo aroused, that kind of numb, um, dissociated feeling where, where the ground doesn't feel right and, and people have a real hard time getting themselves motivated to do anything. So I see people on, the, on both spectrums, people who are in hyper arousal and hypo arousal. And so what mm -hmm. mindfulness does is really build that window of tolerance where, where you can kind of hang out every day in this, in this kind of space where you can go up and down, but that you're not shooting out of that zone. So um, when we talk about, let's say, breathing, uh, we are talking about engaging the parasympathetic nervous system. Here comes like some of the science, right? So um, when you're in sympathetic nervous system, everything is viewed through that fight and flight lens. But when we bring on some of that parasympathetic nervous system, we're able to engage a different part of our brain. When you're in fight flight, which is what hyper arousal is, you don't have access to all the other tools that you can bring on. For example, perspective, seeing, seeing where this lies in the grand scheme of things. And so those are not accessible to us. Options are not readily available to us when we're in this hyper aroused state. 
So by using anything to trigger the parasympathetic nervous system, and breathing is one of them, um, we can definitely try to bring on a little bit of that parasympathetic nervous system. So mindfulness um, uses tools to engage the parasympathetic. So, so I think you'll give us some of those coping tools a little yeah. bit later on, right? Sure, so when you, I think you mentioned like rewiring of the brain or, or you know, with your neural network. Um, could you just describe that process, Sally? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, right now, our amygdalas, which are our fight flight center, they're mm -hmm. all jammed on. We are all in such a, you know, we're all recently unemployed dentists, <laughs> you know, we're all at home, you know, and that's a huge, huge challenge for many of us who are used to being on and on schedule. Uh, what happens is it, it triggers this anxiety. The anxiety triggers the amygdala. The amygdala is the fight flight center, kind of two pea sized shaped areas deep inside the brain. When that mm -hmm. on button is jammed, it really gives us no access to a lot of the different parts of our brain. The hippocampus, which is the mood regulatory center, that's what we're trying to access. We're trying to bring on a little bit of the hippocampus to say, okay, mm -hmm. this is a part of our brain that's really important. If we can quiet down the amygdala, we can bring on the hippocampus and then start to find ways to regulate because most of us right now feel quite dysregulated. So, so you know, I think you're saying that you've got different stresses, not, you know, not all stress is, is bad really. Like, do you, do you study kind of acute versus chronic stress? Because I think now a lot of us are in an acute sense of stress that we're feeling because of the sudden changes to our lives. Is yeah. there in fact a difference, Sally, or? For sure, yeah. So what, um, when I did my research in, at U of T, um, I was trying to see the relationship between stress and periodontal disease. So I actually, um, in, that, in that research, found that there's a difference between acute and chronic stress. So the okay. difference is acute stress has a, um, has a protective mechanism to it. We are in danger. We need to run away from the danger, just like animals in the wild. Acute stress, amazing. Hormones get pumped, heart rate goes up, um, you know, muscles tense up, um, you know, glucose gets released because we all need that. Because if you need to run away, you need that glucose pumping into your system. Amazing. Heart's palpating, respiration is up, we run away. But if that goes on for too long, which it's not supposed to, it's only meant to come on and go off. If we don't notice that and we don't turn it off, we then get into chronic stress, which us humans are not, uh, we have not evolved to develop with chronic stress. If you look at a gazelle who's running away from a predator, it doesn't then run away and then just keep worrying all night about what could have happened. That right. it has a protective mechanism to get rid of all those nasty hormones that are running. Well, some of which are protected, but chronic stress, that's the stress that leads to all those things that we hear, you know, leading to arrhythmias, chronic headaches, tension, backaches, many of which many of us are feeling right now. Right. So it's the awareness that initially this crisis that happened to all of us set off our on button or our fight flight. None of us, you know, probably avoided getting into that kind of acute stress. Now we're kind of a couple of weeks in, and that's kind of turning into the little bit of that chronic. And that, that is probably creating a lot of uh, different symptoms for people. Uh, agitation, constant irritation. I mean, we're all feeling that, um, you know, helplessness and not knowing where we go from here. And so all of those chronic stresses that are going on, that's what we want to kind of try to um, address. And so mindfulness, we look at this difference. We say, okay, we've got the good stress. We've got the bad stress. What state are we in right now? Okay. Is it, you know, we're in chronic stress and, and let's bring on um, some techniques to deal with our chronic stress so that we lessen the damage that this has on us and those around us long-term. And so I think mm -hmm. that's the space that most people are landing in right now and that they're feeling that, okay, well, you know, this has been a while now. And where do we go from here? Right. And I would imagine that that effect on you probably translates to your family members, to your kids, um, to your partners. You know, it, it's almost like a contagious thing. So I, I think 
you know, the point of having this webinar is to really, I think, if you can offer some insights on how can mindfulness, these, we've identified the stresses, we've identified, you know, the acute nature of it as well as now that we're delving into the chronic and this might last for a while. So what sort of, how can we deal with this from a mindfulness approach? Yeah. So what I, what I think that most, most people, when they're, when they're trying to get into a way to deal with anxiety and stress, uh, we always want those around us to also be feeling that urgency to try to deal with it. Many people who've logged on to this webinar probably want to find a way of how am I going to help those around me? How am I going to help my kids and my, and my partners? So um, the best that we can do is model the behavior. So as much as we want to change the outside, we actually have to work on ourselves first. And I know that that is so painful because we all want a quick fix. We want a way where I can just say one thing to you and that you can just take that home tonight or if you're at home, which most of us are, to, to start to implement it right away. And we're going to talk about tools that we can do that with. But when we want to, when we want to help those around us, it has to start with us. That's the modeling. So somebody emailed me the other day and said, I want my kids to practice mindfulness and all this breathing and body scan. You can't. You can't force them. They have to come into it at their own time. But what you can do is you can say, you know, I woke up so anxious today. I tried the five minute breathing exercise and I actually feel better. That's all you can do. Or if you're out on a walk and you want to practice being present, you can point out things. It'll help you. It'll also help them. Like, oh, look at that bird. Is that a blue jay? Or, oh my God, it is actually <laughs> warm today, right? Instead of being on our phone while we're on our walk, um, we can actually bring in that mindfulness in that moment by using those tools. So instead of telling our kids, you know, um, you know, God, like, why are you listening to music instead of just walking? And, and why, why aren't you walking enough? Encourage them. Just say, you know, um, walking really helps me. And so I'm going to go for a walk. If you don't want to join me, I, you know, I really think it, it helps. It helps me clear my mind. So modeling is one way. Instead of telling people what to do, let's model what we do. And those around us will feel it. When I started doing mindfulness at home, um, mm -hmm. my, my partner, uh, you know, my spouse, he is, he was not practicing it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I felt this urge to be like, you need to become mindful, you know, and, and you can't because the everybody, hammer mindfulness right. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, you're not, I'm not going to fight with my partner, my spouse about, you know, being mindful. It's, um, right. when he saw over the year, kind of a couple of years goes by and he's seeing the benefits that it's having for me to ground myself or to do a body scan or to bring some day-to-day -day awareness into my life, it just so happened that it was, like you said, contagious, just like anxiety is contagious. And those of you who are around you, your loved ones will feel it if you're really, really anxious, even without saying words, because so much of our communication is nonverbal. So if you're exuding that energy versus exuding that sort of calm or groundedness as much as you can, that is the way we're gonna teach our children. And a lot of us are concerned about our kids right now. I mean, I think you touched on, and maybe we can talk about it a little bit later, but you touched on sort of the digital detox. I know personally, and I think a lot of us, and the proof is in the pudding, if you see how many attendees are, are watching this webinar, all these the plethora of webinars that are available on Instagram, on Zoom, on Facebook, we're all very connected. And I guess that, you know, being dentists, we're very busy and we need to keep the, the wheels turning. And Personally, I've also, I think I'm busier now than I ever have been because getting to, you know, explore new dimensions, Zoom, I've, I've you know, yes. had some technical glitches, but I've, I'm starting to learn that I'm starting to engage more. But I do find that we're on our devices more. And I see that with my children at home, everyone sort of, you know, they have their Netflix account, they're, everyone kind of sequestered in their own room. And so I know you've written a really nice piece for our, for our journal. Yeah. I think it's also found on your website and yeah. on our website about doing a digital detox. I mean, do you think that now, I think, I think there's a balance, at least for me, there's a balance between remaining connected with my friends and having these Zoom cocktail parties because yes. there is face to face, but then you run the risk of going down that rabbit hole and being really engaged in your devices. And I have personally had to say to myself, okay, I'm modeling this behavior to my kids. I can't expect them to be, you know, mom, let's go have a talk or let's go for a walk. 
if yeah. I'm doing the same thing. Yeah. So I think maybe if you wanted to touch upon a few of the, uh, pieces of advice and if people want to learn more about it, I really would encourage you guys to, to check out Sally's article. I think it was in uh, the previous issue of the Women in Dentistry Journal, we, which you can find online um, through our link in bio on, on either on Facebook or go to the Mindful Dentist. But maybe do you think, does that resonate with you as well? You know, yeah, devices even adding to our anxiety, because I know it does for me at some time. So I need to try to disconnect. Yeah. And, and I'd love to hear what the audience has to say. So again, as you mentioned, the chat is open. So tell us what you think and let us know what your opinions are. And we'll incorporate that into the discussion. Yeah, for sure. So at that, that is so interesting. That article about digital detox, um, we did it together and I did it for your journal was um, because we were seeing that so many of us are on our devices all the time. So some of the tips that I've given at that time, which I think are still applicable now, or a few things, more and I'll, though, yeah, and I'll yeah. kind of list them. We can't get away, especially these days, with um, to be not on our devices. It's the only way we're going to connect. So number one, we're going to we're going to bring some compassion and give ourselves permission to do this. But we're going to be aware when we are doing it solely for mm -hmm. the purpose of disconnecting from what is here, because a lot of us, when we're highly anxious, we go to hyperactivity and overdoing. So that's actually a maladaptive coping. So there's a very interesting diagram that at some point we can talk about. I think maybe about. I'm guilty of that. Right? Yeah, yeah, we all are. And so uh, one way that a lot of us cope with anxiety is hyperactivity. And so instead of sitting with the discomfort, and the question mm -hmm. is, what are you unwilling to feel? If you right. were to sit with your emotions and sit with the fear and anxiety that exists, the question always comes, what are you unwilling to feel? If you were to say right. to yourself, you know, if I were to sit calm for a minute, so that's a really important question, but it ties into being disconnected uh, a little bit to give yourself permission for that. So in that article, some of the points that we wrote was, do not take your phone to the bedroom. And I know as much as COVID is changing day to day, there is, yes. if we want to model behavior, we all, everybody in my family leaves their phone in the kitchen. We do not take our phones upstairs to our bedrooms. We need an opportunity to disconnect for better sleep. So it's, if, if we can make one rule in our house, if that's something that's applicable right now in this very moment from tonight going forward, pick a time, whatever time that is, and disconnect from the phone, put it away because you're gonna sleep better, because you're not gonna read something that's gonna trigger you just before you go to bed. We don't need that. You can read it the next morning. Uh, number two, put your phone on airplane mode. So if you are really disconnecting, really make an active effort to disconnect. Some of us are like, I'll just put my phone away. But the minute it pings, we run to it. The ping is like a little ding, like I gotta I'm be on, right? Yeah. yeah. When you are, when, when the phone is ruling your life and other people's messages and wanting you is what is dominating your day to day, then you are living for what other people's um, sort of mission is and not yours. Right. So the reason to disconnect is to take control of that. One of the other tools is to get rid of some of the apps that, you, that, are, that are really harming you. So for example, I used to have a lot of different news apps on my phone and I just would mm -hmm. click it and, and, and they would notify me. So turning notifications off is actually a really important way to disconnect from some of this a little bit. Um, we cannot get away from because hmm. we get, you know, alert. I have CTV, I have CNN, alert, yeah. alert. And you're you kind of tense up that I think that's actually a very practical to just shut down the, you yeah. know, you should be in control of when you see yes. media information. 100% Effie. So if you want to go watch the news, you know where to go to watch the news. You don't need CNN to tell you that a tiger just got diagnosed with COVID. Yes. I mean, we're not in New York. I haven't pet a tiger recently. What does it matter to me that a tiger has COVID? But when the pain comes on, I need to figure out how did the tiger get COVID? And did I get COVID from the dog that I pet at the park? So we it go all down to Tiger King, to right? The Netflix show. It's all you go exactly. Right? You go down a rabbit hole. You didn't even intend to go there. Did you wake up today needing to know if a tiger in New York had it? If you did, you could follow that path and see. But if that wasn't your intention, then your digital, which is which is supposed to support you and help you, is actually right. hindering you. 
So with our children, my kids need to be on Zoom. I actually, when they're on Zoom or when they're on their um, digital coursework, which started today for all the public school kids, um, we, take, we take the other device away. So you don't need your computer and your phone all at the same time. So the phone goes away, the computer comes on, and I actually encourage them to, to shut down the other apps. So for example, for this Zoom meeting today, I closed down all my other um, apps so that I'm not going to see anything else come up. I encourage you to do the same. If you are going to get on another Zoom call, turn off all the other apps so that when you're on this Zoom, looking at this webinar, you're not getting that email pinging on the upper right of the screen because that's going to distract you from where you are. That's mindfulness. Being right. present, controlling right. that you want to be here right now, that's kind of mindfulness. So the other tips and tools, um, I think, um, are in that article, and I and I would welcome any other sort of tools that people have to to deal with that. It's it's tough though. Yeah, no, I think actually that's a great. You know what? I just thought of it. We'll we'll include um, the article in in the follow up email that we sent to the attendees because yeah. I read it and I thought it was brilliant. And yeah. I've I've tried to adopt some of those changes. And I think you know the key is to be present and to be in the moment because mm -hmm. that. And I think you'll elaborate that. That's probably one of the techniques that, you know, coping strategies on how to, to deal with, you know, how to incorporate mindfulness. So, yeah. um, so I would encourage people to read that article because I think it's, it's wonderful. So yeah. Sally, can you discuss some of the techniques that can help us? So let's get to the, to the yeah. meat and potatoes. And I mean, sure. you can talk for hours about this topic, but I want people to leave here kind of getting some factual um, tips that they can go and take to their day-to-day -day lives to help deal with the anxiety that we're feeling now. What can you offer the audience? For sure. Listen, as dentists, we're used to being on. We are used mm -hmm. to a schedule um, that is by 15 minute blocks. So let's not right. lose sight of the fact that this is very unnerving for many people to not have a schedule. So something that's helped for me, and this is, this is part of all the, I'm gonna give you all the tools that I've been using and all the tools that's out there in the research, is how do we bring on a little bit of um, sort of mindfulness? It's a practice. Just okay. like if you were to sit and hear um, a trainer talk about how to build muscle, you, mm. you will not become muscular. No matter how much of that webinar you watch on a trainer telling you how to build triceps and biceps and your core, you got to do the work. It's the very same, unfortunate. <laughs> right? I know, and no one has a trainer now, but it, it's the same, um, it's the same uh, concept. Um, neuroplasticity is the science of the brain being plastic and we can actually rewire our brain and we can do that with practice. So if we want to develop more presence, let's say you want the ability to be able to use these tools just to bring that on board is a step forward. Just the intention that I want to become more mindful is, is a step in the right direction. So when we talk about um, the practice, the practice is the dirty work. That's the stuff that we got to do every day. So what are the things that we can start to do right away? Because we're dentists and we're used to schedules and we're used to tight, tight schedules, we need to make a schedule. So I urge all of you who are feeling very dysregulated with your days to start making a schedule. You incorporate digital detox so you don't touch your phone until whatever time, let's say 8.30. If you're an early bird, like I am, and you know that you wake up at a certain time, let's say it's 5.30, 6.30, okay? Right. You wake up, you can right away incorporate any one of the mindfulness tools that could be a breathing exercise or a guided meditation. So I know that um, for many of us, um, when we hear the word meditation, right away, it's like, mm -hmm. I, oh, it's, as soon as people go and meditate, oh, I can't do that. Well, there's a lot, of, stuff, right? <laughs> a lot of great apps talk about guided meditation. So don't um, sit there and just keep thinking that, oh, I just got to keep sitting and something is going to happen. No, grab, grab your phone on airplane mode. You've downloaded, let's say from Headspace, which is an app, or Calm, which is an app. You can download those. Set your intention the night before. Tomorrow morning when I wake up at 7.45, I'm going to do a five-minute breathing exercise. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. And Headspace actually has a one-minute breathing exercise. So if five minutes seems too long, do a one-minute. 
So you schedule in because the things that get scheduled are the things that get done. Any of you who are watching this, put it in your schedule. So you have to schedule in, just like you schedule going to the gym, you have to schedule in time in your day that you're going to start to practice mindfulness. So if that's a five-minute breathing exercise, then that's five minutes. A simple technique is called the, the hand breathing exercise. I'm just going to quickly show you. You hold up your hand. You inhale on the up. Exhale on the down. Inhale on the up exhale on the down. You do that once. The second time you do it, you just do it a millisecond slower. Mm -hmm. You have your hand available to you at all times, and you can just do this one quick exercise. So breathing triggers the parasympathetic nervous system, and don't okay. worry how you breathe. Whatever way you're breathing is fine. Mindfulness, just when you bring awareness to it, ask you to pay attention to the way you breathe and maybe slow it down by a millisecond. And so right. that kind of triggers the parasympathetic. The so other way- So if I understand correctly, yeah. when you breathe, that's the only way to really reduce, bring down your heart. Is that correct? That's the only exercise that can, that can actually do that. And isn't that what kind of mindfulness is yeah. based around? Yeah, so there, there's tons of science that, that really the most direct way of slowing down the heart rate is with breathing. And that's huge in yoga too. So if you hear people talking about the various type of breathing exercises, it is so great in really triggering because the diaphragm is a massive muscle. It helps to trigger the parasympathetic nervous system. We all have that readily available. So the reason many folks in the mindfulness community talk about the breath, because it's the one thing that has a very direct, immediate effect. You actually cannot be sympathetic, fight flight, when you're doing a deep breath. The two cannot coexist because biologically, if you want to run away from a predator, you don't have time to take a, you know, sit there and breathe. You're in that chest, shallow breath, you got to get away. So the minute you sort of do that diaphragm breath, you will have to be triggering your parasympathetic nervous system. So breathing is a great tool. Scheduling those little breaks throughout your day that you can breathe is a wonderful way to commit to this. Many of us who are home right now, we're wondering what can we do? You know, all the things that we want to be doing to fill our day, the way we used to fill our days when we were working. So the way you can fill your day now is many of us have, have always loved the opportunity to bring on some coping tools into our lives. And what a better time than now, because all this that you practice now, you'll apply to your life once this is over and they'll be ingrained and it will, we will be rewiring the network. So when we do get back into our stressful lives, we've now developed some of these tools. And that's the hope, I guess, to incorporate some changes. I mean, I've been reading a lot of articles on what the world is going to look like after this pandemic. Yes. And I think there'll be a lot of changes to the way we practice dentistry. I think there'll be a lot of changes to the way we communicate with one another, uh, changes to education. I think we'll see a lot more of these webinar platforms sustaining themselves. Um, but I think beyond that is also, to your point, of how we handles stress and how you know if we can take away from this awful kind of period in yeah. history the pandemic if we can take away some mindfulness approaches some you know quick and easy ways to incorporate mindfulness and you know breathing being one of them i think that if there are any silver linings then at least maybe we can have a life with more intention and a life with more kind of um being yeah. aware of our, of our position and our yeah and mental. that's yeah, and that's actually exactly what everybody in, our, in my mindfulness community platforms are saying, are saying that this is actually a great opportunity to reset the system. Just like our planet is resetting, you're seeing all these things that are happening in the wild that we never saw before. Many of you have seen images of, you know, the, the Venice or, you know, dolphins or, or the earth. And sometimes, you know, as horrible as this disease has been, and many of us know people who've been affected, and my heart goes out to everybody who's had to suffer through this. And I think about those folks all the time. I also do think about the people who are at home and having and suffering in their own way through this challenge. And so the thing is, let's do our part in trying to uh, use this opportunity to build those skills. A lot of people have reached out to me and said, Sally, how do I, you know, what, how do we build resilience? Mm -hmm. And so uh, resilience actually has five pillars. 
And there's been research done through Ryerson and actually on Ryerson University's uh, core programs, they have something called Thrive RU. And that's a program that is teaching um, uh, university students how to build resilience. It's a credit course that's teaching them how to build it. But it's based on these five pillars. Two of those five pillars have to do with mindfulness. And so one is self-compassion. The other one is is the, the word mindfulness, they use it loosely, but really the intention to bring awareness into our day-to-day -day life. And so um, self-compassion is one of the pillars to build resilience. What a great time to start building self-compassion. Many of us are not compassionate to the situation we're living in right now. Please mm -hmm. give yourself the permission to, to feel okay that, that this is a difficult time. We want to block all those emotions out. We want to just tough, tough it out and, and, you know, and I'm going to just make it through this no matter. We are. We're going to make it through this, but let's come out stronger. Let's not survive. Let's thrive. Let, let's come out of this better than we went into it. And so self-compassion gives us the opportunity to practice um, kind of care for ourselves. So give yourselves things that you know make you feel better. If that's a warm shower before you go to bed every night, if that's really nice warm fuzzy socks, if that's making time in your schedule to take a bath because none of us ever have time to do it, if that is giving yourself permission to read a good book, let yourself do those things because that's what's gonna build resilience. There's, there's kind of misinformation that the more you do, the better you become. And it's actually not always true. The more doing doesn't, doesn't mean that you're, you're doing better. It's just you're doing more. And so let's do, let's do something for ourselves because we know that self-compassion will build resilience. So be kind to yourselves. Give yourselves, you're here now on this platform. Give yourself permission to do more things like that and to, and to um, uh, bring in some of the practices that we know build um, on mindfulness um, and self-compassion. And mm -hmm. go ahead. I think a lot of us struggle as as parents, as you know, caregivers. That if you do something for yourself, yeah. it's being selfish. Right. Um, I know I struggle with that all the time. Like, oh, I, I shouldn't do that. Like, are the kids going to be okay? If I travel, if I this, if I that, and is it being yeah. selfish? And, you know, I need some validation for my children to say, it's okay, mom, we really don't care that you're here, you know, we love you, go do what you need to do. But how do you address that feeling of selfishness as a parent, father, mother, you know, parents in general, kind of doing something for yourself? I think it's probably the opposite of being selfish. I think if you make yourself better, then you can be more present and better for your family. Would you agree to that? Yeah, hundred percent, Effie. When I started uh, practicing mindfulness, it actually required me to go away for a couple of mindfulness retreats. So to do these courses, um, you have to practice. You you can't just preach it. You have to sit with the pain and with with the challenge of meditating for twelve hours a day, which is a challenge. And so I I had such a difficult time to allow mm -hmm. myself to do that because a it wasn't related to dentistry. I, I somehow thought if it was a dental course, it was okay, but because it's not, it's not okay. So related to that. <laughs> yeah. Right. And for some reason. Yeah. And you know, and, and what you've done Effie to bring non-clinical things and make them for CE, it, it really is great because, um, because it actually helps people. To, to look at other non-clinical things like what we're doing today. Because I thought it was very selfish of me to go away for a week to meditate. But the right. profound changes that it has had on me as a person using mindfulness and compassion in my own life, that it has trickled down to my kids without me doing anything different with them. Right. If you're a parent that is highly anxious, highly stressed, it's actually better you're not around your kids. Mm than if you're around them and always angry, stressed, upset, flustered. You're doing more favors for them by, by taking care of yourself because we're not modeling good behavior if we're, if we're just wrapped up in, in our chaotic lives. So it's actually the opposite of selfish, like you said, to take care of yourself and to bring this, this kind of practices into your life because you'll parent better. You, when you parent less anxious, when you parent more mindfully, you're able to then not only model the, the right behavior, but also to bring on creative ideas 
Okay, mm-hmm. you don't want to go for a walk right now? I respect you. Rather than, you better go for a walk right now. If you don't go outside right now, I'm going to take away this, 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 you know? And so the list goes on. What I do is I say, you know what? I think it's really good for you to go for a walk right now. I understand mm-hmm. that this is not the right time for you, but I urge you before the day is over to go for a walk. And you know, a teenager, they're kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know, that kind of attitude. And what I say is I put up a boundary. I say, you cannot speak to me in that disrespectful tone. So I'm walking away from this conversation and I am here for you. I will sit right on this couch. And when you're ready to engage, we can talk again. And if that means you have to threaten them to do that, no problem. I've had to say, I'm going to take away your phone until you can come back to this conversation in a respectful manner, sit with me without yelling so that we can get through this really important topic. And so we need to parent and to be, and the better parent you are, the, the more compassionate you are, the more mindful you are, the, the more present you are. I think a lot of, for a lot of us, and maybe, maybe just for me, but I think for me, a, a default or for some people, a default for, you know, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling stressed, if you have a deadline that you're having difficulty meeting, the kid comes and asks you for something, yes. you can take a bark at them or to kind of, you know, dismiss them or to be short with them. And I think that that's to your point of, you know, taking a moment, you know, either stepping away, taking a deep breath, incorporating mindfulness into your day to day will really help you become a better parent and help you, you yeah. know, minimize the amount of snapping because I don't know about you guys, but with four kids, I, I sometimes snap. So, oh, yeah. You know, and you know, that is really important. Yeah. And the self compassion is if you, if you snap, um, just the awareness that you snapped, that's mm-hmm. mindfulness. Just yeah. a moment pause where I snap too. I snap, mm-hmm. that's a reminder for me that I'm not present. It is my, right. it is my first mm-hmm. reminder. It's like an alarm. The minute I react rather than respond to my kids, I know I'm out of the zone. So we talk yeah. about stress reaction versus stress response. When you're reactive to your stresses in your day to day, like everything's got to be done now with a tight deadline and and everything's got that kind of fast zinginess to it, I know I'm being reactive. So mindfulness builds being responsive to life. Responsive is bring in a pause, just a split second. And I bet you half the things that we would say we would not say if we had that pause. So when we talk about the practice of mindfulness, people say, why do I need to meditate or breathe? To, to not snap at my kids. What you're building when you are sitting on a cushion breathing, when you are bringing awareness into your life, you're building that muscle in the brain that instead of going into a reaction, goes into a response. So what you do every day with walking in nature, disconnecting from the phone, tapping into the emotions you don't wanna feel, what you're doing is you're building that muscle of mindfulness. So the next time your kid barges in the room with something absurd, which it seems like they all do and and we do too, and you will actually have that split second, that muscle, that neural network has been trained not to go into fight flight, but to take that pause and make a decision what you're gonna say. That decision might be, right now's not the time for us to talk about this. That's a better response than, you know, when we just kind of lose it. And that is a much more mindful response, even if you don't want to address it at that point. The minute that you stopped, and even your response in a calm way was, I can't address this with you right now. I need about 15 minutes, and I'll get back to you. That gives us the opportunity to bring mindfulness in. So the practices of breathing, the practice of doing guided meditations, the practice of disconnecting and feeling things is to build the mindfulness practice. So that when you need it, when you're with a patient and you're getting triggered, because we all remember those days where we've got the difficult patient or we've got that scenario, if we're building those muscles now, when we're back into our day-to-day lives, we have stress with staff, with coworkers, with patients, with ourselves, you know, the judgments we do to ourselves with the work that we do. And so these tools will actually carry on into our, into our professional life but why not practice it with the people who matter most to us, which is our family. So I hear often, so, I mean, if I'm, I'm kind of telling the list in my head of, of, you know, points that I can take away from this webinar day, 
Um, and I know we're not done yet, but number one is set a schedule um, for yourself because that will kind of keep you in check and schedule in a digital detox, schedule in an exercise break, schedule in a Zoom call that's social, schedule in the webinars that you want to partake in that day um, and make sure there's some of our webinars, right? Um, so number one is schedule mindfulness. And again, for those of us who are not yet really familiar, there are um, apps that you like so to name a few headspace you said and uh, calm um, mm -hmm. okay so they'll, they'll guide us again this is not supposed to be a crash course in yep. mindfulness but just to give you some tips yep. um number three would be um self-compassion yeah so and, and self-care so whatever that means for you listening to a particular song or music or taking a bath or going for a walk or whatever you find there yeah. Another thing that I've heard of is, you know, talk about gratitude and, yeah. and it's often, I'll tell you, sometimes I get frustrated when, you know, if I'm saying something to, if I'm venting to my sister, yeah. I have two sisters at my door and, you know, if I vent and, and they'll say, well, you know, you've got to be grateful for this. Like, I know I'm grateful. Like yeah. I am grateful for these things, but I'm still pissed off about this. Yeah. How do you incorporate gratitude into it? Is that part of yeah. mindfulness? Is that yeah. part of you know, coping during this time. Yeah. So for sure, gratitude is a, um, is a huge pillar of mindfulness. So research has shown that people who are gratitude, uh, have practiced a lot of gratitude are actually also very resilient. So there's a lot of research out there to show the benefits of practicing gratitude. So gratitude. What do you mean by practicing gratitude? Yeah. So there's different ways to practice gratitude. So one way is what we've all heard, which is journaling. So people say, write down three things by your bed every night or every morning. So choose a time. Just jot mm -hmm. down three things that you're grateful for. And they do not have to be big. They could be, for example, the other day I was grateful for my lungs. <laughs> You know, just, I was happy that my lungs were functioning. I was grateful for my body that I was actually able to breathe in and out okay. So I was grateful for my lungs. I was grateful for my warm socks. Doesn't have to be big. There is no research to show that the bigger, the bigger the thing you're grateful for, the better it is. No, it's anything you're grateful for. I'm mm -hmm. grateful for that amazing, um, I had ice cream delivered to my house the other day, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. It came behind the door and that I was grateful for that. So your gratitude can be in a way of a journaling, doesn't have to be big. And um, we can actually, we practice this in the office too, gratitude. We actually go around and everybody says something they're grateful for. So, you know, you can practice it. Your team yeah. huddle, you can do it, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can practice it with your family members. So last night before my son went to bed, I said, what's one thing you're grateful for? And he's, you know, for, for his game. So, okay, you're you know, perfect. It doesn't have to be big. You don't have to make it a big deal. Mm -hmm. So practicing gratitude can be formal, like you're writing it down, or it can be informal. You can actually um, practice it uh, during the day. So you're walking around, you see a beautiful tree. I'm grateful for the tree for producing oxygen. Doesn't have to be big. But what is shown is whatever way you're practicing gratitude, you cannot be stressed and grateful at the same time. So the minute you bring in some gratitude, you cannot, yeah, you can't be stressed at the same time, right? Now, something to address what you said, Effie, is, you know, we have to also be careful who we share things with. And, <laughs> and sometimes our best intentioned people, our family, have the best intention. Mm -hmm. But that isn't what you needed at that time. You're a very grateful right. person. I know you. And I know what a kind, right. compassionate, and grateful person you are. But in that moment, when you were expressing your frustration to a family member, you, you didn't need that at that moment. So you are a grateful right. person. But people, when they try to help us cope with things, they don't often... They, they don't often know what you need at that time. And actually, if you have a friend that runs to you with pain, the best you can do is acknowledge what they're feeling. The right. worst thing you can do is be a mindless listener because a mindful listener hears what the person says and actually just sits with that. And if you're a right. mindful listener, you're not thinking about what you're going to say in that moment to cheer them up. You're just going to acknowledge what they said. So if you run to me and say, I'm having the craziest time, I'm not going to say, Effie, you need to be more mindful. That's demeaning. Mm -hmm. And that actually yeah. doesn't help you in that moment. If you're up in this, you know, hyper aroused state, I'm not going to 
uh, go to my kid who's completely out of control and say, honey, you need to breathe. That's the wrong thing to do. You need to acknowledge, you know, I would say, I see Ariana, you are so, you're in pain. You are really in pain right now with what's happening. I'm really sorry about that. And so that just acknowledging what people are holding through calms them down. So as much as our family kind of wants to help in that moment, yes, we all know we should practice gratitude, but you set the gratitude right. terms on your terms, not on other people's terms. So what my response would be, actually in my day-to-day life, I am very grateful, but in this moment, I actually just need to vent, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, and there are times where I do mindless things and, you know, it would be very painful if someone said to me, Oh, Sally, you know, you preaching mindfulness, you rarely practice. Yeah, that would be terrible. So the thing right. is, we self-compassion and compassion for others is, is to be supportive and to be there for those people in your life who you care about and to treat yourself like you would your friends and to speak to mm-hmm. yourself in, in that way. So if I've been hurt, I try to talk to myself as if I just said, you know, what would I say to a friend? So gratitude is huge. We do have to practice gratitude. So the other, um, the, so the, the other uh, piece is that um, this all has to come with no judgment. So the biggest piece of mindfulness is the judgment. You need to listen to the voices that constantly are bringing you down. And actually, we are saying the worst things to ourselves that we would never say to anybody. We're so hard on ourselves. So take this time to also hear the voices because there are some voices that come from us that are so harsh. You're never gonna get this right. You're not good at this. You don't try hard enough. You're not a good enough parent. When you hear those voices, you're out of the zone. So just sit, sit and go out of the zone, You know, put up your hands and be like, I'm out of the zone. I'm not gonna continue this. I'm gonna stop these voices and I'm gonna take a breath or I'm gonna just, you know, bring myself out of this scenario because some of the harshest critics are actually living within us. So sometimes I say to people, I'm like, don't worry. You're not saying anything that I have not said to myself. Absolutely. I think we are, at least I can personally speak. I'm my worst critic. and my yeah. biggest. Critic. I think, you know, understanding that. And um, I, I think it's really relevant to see that we're not alone, that we're, yeah. you know, all of us are. Yeah things that we can work on for sure. Sally, we have a question from one of our audience members asking if you meditate daily or what you yeah. incorporate in your personal life daily. What, how, what would you say to that? Yeah, so there's a great question. There's two types of practicing mindfulness. So people sometimes say, um, you know, do you meditate? So mm-hmm. mindfulness is not meditation. I practice mindfulness informally in all of my life as much as I can. So if I'm speaking to someone, I try to practice mindful listening. If I'm engaged here or with a patient, I try to be there. So that's the informal way that I practice mindfulness is constantly bringing myself back to my body. And actually a body scan, which is a type of meditation, really helps in body awareness. So if you, whoever's listening right now, if you can feel your sit bones on the chair, the back of your legs, and if you can feel your feet on the ground, that's a body scan right there, dropping into the body, out of the mind. That right there is a type of meditation. But yes, I actually do a formal meditation, and uh, the formal meditation that I do varies in length in the morning. So I do it every morning before the house wakes up. I go downstairs. I do all my meditation guided. There are people that do it non-guided. I do guided. I put my headphones in. Yeah. Okay. I put my headphones in. I have different um, sort of meditation teachers that I've listened to over the years. So I have a collection of um, things that I've downloaded on my phone. And I will use a five minute, 10 minute, if I'm in the mood, 20 minute meditation. And it's guided. So it's prompted. I'm very heady, just like most of us are. I function from the neck up 90% of the time. So by using a guided meditation, I then drop down constantly into my body because the the person who's running the meditation tells you, you know, now take another breath. Do you feel your chest expanding? Do you feel your belly expanding? So when I do guided formally, that's what's building the muscle for me to practice my informal. So yes. Yeah. So depends on the mood. I try not to be harsh on myself. If I can actually get myself on a cushion on my couch with my earbuds in, I usually can do about 
15 to 30 minutes. Wow. But I have done them as short as five minutes. Mm -hmm. I have done them before I even get out of bed where I'm just lying there concentrating on my breathing, focusing on my toes, doing a quick body scan. So I don't judge myself. But again, keep in mind that I've gone on retreats where I've, I've done these meditations for days and hours on end. So it is something that you have to develop over time, but please do not be harsh on yourself. If five minutes of breathing is all you can do, that is meditation. The minute you tell yourself the night before, I'm going to meditate tomorrow morning, you'll do it. Mm -hmm. It's just setting the intention. Now, um, schedule, yeah, right? Yeah, you have to schedule it. So on my website, I actually have the meditations and I've been running these videos every day where I'm trying to talk about meditation and helping guide people through them. So uh, reach out if you need resources. I think we're always available to, to give you any resources that you need. Okay, we got another question um, and I'll just read it out. Um, I wonder, I wonder about self-care, which may include habits you're guilty about, for example, chocolate or wine. Mm -hmm. Is it better to avoid these things or be less judgmental? That's a very good question. 100%. What so, you say yeah, you are absolutely right. Like, you are absolutely right that those are part of our lives. And it would be really silly for anybody, including myself, to say to not indulge in those things. If that brings you joy and happiness, you have to do it. And if, if a glass of wine helps you unwind, do it. Two glasses, do it. If you're aware of yourself and you know that, that if you're if some people are drinking and, and they actually fall into some troublesome drinking, that's not healthy. And I would not say that you use drinking as a way to numb um, feelings. So if it's, if I'm going to drink because I'm so sick and tired of my life, that's a completely different habit, which most of you are not in, but a person who's using drinking as a way to de-stress as, as, as something delicious that they do at the end of their day, do it. If you love eating chocolate, eat it mindfully, take your time, make eating your chocolate a thing, sit in the sun, open the wrapper, savor it. Um, absolutely. And, and, I think more now than ever, bring in all those things that make you feel good. We all need those things that really bring that kind of warmth into the body. So um, good meals, delicious food, do it. Yeah, for sure. That, that, that's a very good answer as well. Um, I think we're approaching the end of the hour and we can continue a little bit longer. That's not a big deal. But I think Sally, um, you've given a lot of wonderful information here. And we'll follow up with an email with a link to your website as well, which again, Sally has done these videos, daily videos that are on her website that I think you will all enjoy. I've stayed tuned in and I've watched it. Since speaking about mindfulness with Sally, I've definitely incorporated it a little bit more into my life and, and really trying to be aware of my, my present. And I think that um, having an understanding, knowing that, you know, or at least tap, tweaking your interest in mindfulness, you can get a lot more information. Um, so much so that Al Sally was talking about, you know, mindful listening. There's also a topic that she talks about mindful leadership. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that at, at depth, in depth, and so, so interested in it that we will be having, we'll have Sally back again as one of our guests on April the 24th. We're planning to do, or we are doing a co-hosted or co-program with the Canadian Dental Association with the CDA. So you will be getting more information about that. And one of the topics that Sally is going to talk, one of the topics in that session um, is going to be mindful leadership. So for more insights on how to be an effective leader mm -hmm. to your staff, to your assistants, even if you're an associate where you have, you know, you're young and you're new in the field, how can you bring a mindful leadership approach, which I think will be really relevant to our listeners. Um, so again, uh, just to kind of inform you that we are gonna be doing a longer three hour or so um, event on April 24th. Sally will be one of our guests. We've got some other wonderful speakers who will talk about clinical and non-clinical items. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is practice recovery after COVID. What should we expect? How can we deal with that? So again, stay tuned for more information there. And now I, I do want to, you know, thank Sally. I think we've got a lot of positive feedback here. Um, one 
part, uh, one comment was, you know, thank you for talking about something that's non-clinical. Thank you for making us feel like we're not alone. And I think mm -hmm. to me, that's my biggest goal with women in dentistry. And, and it's not only to women, Dr. Rosopoulos said, thank you for the information, even for your male counterparts. So we're all the same. We're not here to have any gender you know, differences or biases. Men are welcome to attend our sessions. But um, you know, my goal is to really help unite everyone to bring forth topics that are really interesting and relevant. Um, and you guys can feel free to interject and let me know what resonates with you. One topic that I was just thinking about um, yesterday when I was out for a walk is uh, to have a talk on with an expert on um, dementia and Alzheimer's. So I will bring in my personal story, my personal struggle with my father who's suffering from dementia and how it has a devastating toll on our family and, uh, and, and me personally. But beyond that, how you know, I think it's very relevant with our patients that we see in our practices. So many of them are, you know, in the aging population, particularly as a prosthodontist, we see these patients and dementia and Alzheimer's is so prevalent in society. I think information about that would be really good on a personal level for those of you who are dealing with it with a loved one, and as well as a professional level on how to deal with it from, uh, from a practice standpoint so that your staff are in tune. So, you know, these young millennials may not have, you know, who may be your assistants may not have any experience with older relatives and not understand a patient who comes in that's suffering from dementia. So again, stay tuned for that. We're going to have an expert talk about that as well in an interview style format. And I just want to express my utmost gratitude to Sally for taking an hour out of her time to oh, share this information um, with us. She's a brilliant, she's a beautiful human being inside and out, a wonderful source of information. So again, please check out her website, mindfuldentist.ca. She's going to be doing more and more workshops and retreats, et cetera. So this is just the beginning. If you've only just met her, you're honestly in for, for a treat because she's as beautiful as she is on screen. That's how her, her heart is as well. So Sally, I'm going to leave you, the Abby. floor to you to end up and, uh, and tell us what you think about, you know, what is your last take home messages? What can our viewers, what should we take home with us today? And how should we incorporate mindfulness in our future? I'll, I'll leave the floor to you to finish sure. out the presentation. Um, again, thank you, Effie, so much. And the feelings are, you know, are 100% mutual. And if it wasn't for you encouraging me to get out there and do it, I wouldn't have done it to begin with. So thank you so much. And, um, and I just want to thank everybody for joining. If you were here, it's probably because you're interested in having something, some way um, to bring, to bring some, um, some of this into your life. And please know that you're not alone. Um, that's, I think my biggest take home here is, um, you know, I couldn't get myself to even think about doing a webinar or video uh, three weeks ago. And so I was, I, I myself couldn't imagine this new reality that's happened for us. So in no way am I, am I saying that, you know, practice some mindfulness and all your troubles will go away. That is not the message. The message is we're all in this together. I'm practicing every day I'm learning from you as well and so let's let's be a team and help ourselves support each other support the people in your lives who are not on these platforms and uh, and we'll get through this challenging time yeah and check in with your friends right check yes. in with people yes. that closed off more yeah absolutely yes. thank you thank you Sally thank, thank you, you thank you so much audience. thank you for tuning in um, and we promise to bring you more exciting and informative and relevant topics. So stay tuned. Check us out on Instagram at Women's Dentistry on Facebook, Women in Dentistry, Work-Life Balance. And we look forward to speaking with you soon and seeing you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.